Hello everyone, this is Liz, live from the Dairy Public Library. If you don't know where I am, I'm currently sitting in part of the nonfiction section. And I'm here today, as it is Monday, and we're talking about um, directors that you should know. And today we are talking about another great filmmaker named John, in this case, John Carpenter. Although, as I discuss him, you're going to find that he has a little bit more in common with John Waters than you would think. And it's not just because they share the first name. So you probably know who John Carpenter is, or you've at the very least seen one of his movies, as he's a prolific director and um, has made a lot of classics. Um, but let's get started at the beginning. He was born January 16th in 1948 in Carthage, Carthage, New York, but he actually moved to Kentucky when he was about five years old and was kind of raised there. And he was influenced by movies like The Thing from Another World, which definitely comes up later, and Forbidden Planet. So he was inspired by genre films from a very early age. And he actually went to University of Southern California's film school, but he dropped out to make his first movie. So we got to start with short films like Captain Voyeur and The Resurrection of Bronco Billy. Um, and his first major studio film was Dark Star in 1974, which overall... I think still holds up pretty well. It's a great debut feature. And the movie that got him a little bit more attention, I would say really put him on the map, was Assault on Precinct 13, which came out in 1976. Much better than the remake, I would say. And then in 1978, everything changes with a little movie called Halloween. Um, I mean, it, words cannot describe the impact that this movie had. And also, at the time, and for a really long time, I think until Blair Witch came along, it was the most successful independent film of all time. So he got to put that feather in his cap as an accomplishment. And he got pigeonholed into, he, into as a horror director, he still does, um, but he got kind of put into that... Um, track very quickly and he did try to kind of um, branch out a bit um, and in 1979 he directs a TV movie about Elvis and this isn't that important I usually don't include TV movies but it is important for one thing the star Kurt Russell and this starts a long period of collaboration with that actor so the 80s where we get into I would say golden period John Carpenter I really don't think there's any bad movies here I would only say one is weak, but the rest, I think, are either stone-cold classics to very good and watchable. So 1980, we have The Fog, starring his then-wife, Adrian Barbeau, and it's about a town that has a dark secret, and they find out that the founders that they kind of valorize and celebrate aren't as good as they thought they were. Timely film as we're talking about, like, hey, maybe we shouldn't talk about, have, have a holiday for Christopher Columbus. Um... That does fairly well, doesn't get great reviews. 1981 is his first, his first feature film collaboration with Kurt Russell, and that is Escape from New York, which is a fantastic movie. And much like a lot of movies in the early 80s, it still has a very 70s feel. I would say you pair this movie with The Warriors and you have an amazing double feature. Fun fact about this, um, Escape from New York was actually the first date movie that my mom and my dad saw together. I wish they were still that cool. In 1982 comes what is my one of my favorite films of all time, definitely my top five, uh, one of the movies I've seen the most, and that is his version of The Thing, which is a re not really a remake of Thing from Another World, but an adaptation of the same story, which is Who Goes There? And this film... If you see documentaries about it, and there's actually a good documentary for free on YouTube, you can just find it. It's called Tear Take Shape. And it's about the amount of um, scripting work and set work and prop work by uh, Rob Bodine, um, Bodine specifically, making all the models for these creatures and this thing. The amount of work that went into it, and then it was immediately savaged as gross, as junk, as exploitative. And to make matters worse... E.T. came out the week before, and that just steamrolled over every other movie that came out. So, actually, Blade Runner got kind of steamrolled by E.T. too. So, this was a passion project for John, and he just saw it trashed by people. 
And he actually ended up losing some movie deals and directing jobs because of it. However, he still managed to kind of work his way back into good graces and adapted Stephen King's Christine, which did manage to make a profit and kind of saved his career in a bit. And I don't think Christine is up there with stuff like Halloween and The Thing, but Christine is still one of the better King adaptations. In 1994, uh, 1984, he actually gets some Academy clout. So he directs this film, Starman, starring Jeff Bridges. And that actually garners Jeff Bridges an Academy Award nomination. Uh, 1986, another one of my favorite John Carpenter films, Big Trouble in Little China. So this is an homage to the old Kung Fu films of the 70s. And it is a lot of fun. There's a lot of good lore. And it's also a good subversion of kind of the big man action star that Jack Burton, um, Kurt Russell plays, where he's kind of a buffoon and the real hero is the sidekick character. It is a great movie. There's a lot of fun effects. And if you are a Kung Fu fan or like any kind of a Hong Kong martial arts movie, you should definitely see Big Trouble in Little China. And again, another movie that when it came out wasn't appreciated, found Second Life on VHS. 1987, we have Dark, Prince of Darkness, the only one of his 80s output I would consider to be not super great. And then in 1988, another one of his films that has found just such a life after its initial relief, the fantastic They Live, um, starting, the, starting the wonderful Rowdy Roddy Piper, dearly departed. Fun fact, I met Rowdy Roddy Piper and he is a sweetheart. Um, this is, a, you know, he explicitly says it is kind of an anti-Reagan's America, anti-Uber, just um, be out for yourself. And it's kind, it's a dystopia, but it feels, again, when you watch it today, you're like, it still feels relevant. Um, so we have his 80s output, which is great. And then we move into the 90s, which, uh, oh boy, 90s were not kind to John Carpenter. He had films that were not only critically maligned, but they were box office failures. Um, he has Memoirs of an Invisible Man, which is the only movie he will never talk about. Um, he'll talk about every movie, the ones that did well, the ones he didn't like making, except Memoirs of an Invisible Man. That's got to tell you something. Um, he also has a Vampires in 97. He has The Village of the Damned remake in 95, which I will depend, defend parts of that movie, specifically Christopher Reeves, but... It, I'm going to admit, overall not great. Um, despite the fact that there is a great death in there, and it is a person who fell asleep on a grill. Uh, creative. Um, the only actually good movie that came out of his in the 1990s was 1994's In the Mouth of Madness, starring Sam Neill, which is kind of an ode to Lovecraft and also the power of stories. Another one of those, if you haven't seen it, I'd watch it. I think it's really worth it. And I will say that although it's not considered a good movie, and it didn't make it a lot of money. Escape from L.A. is still well-received enough and has had a little bit more of a, you know, people looking at it again and reassessing it. And unfortunately, his last major studio picture was in 2001, and that was Ghost of Mars. And he pretty much said that, you know, 90s wore him out. He was sick of filmmaking. He was sick of the studio system. And he pretty much retired from filmmaking, save for directing a few episodes of Masters of Horror. And he did direct a small 2012 film called The Ward. Um, so what's he doing now? Well, I mean, he's still living, thankfully. I don't know, 2020 might pull something. I hope it doesn't. Um, he's also making music. He actually scored a lot of his own movies. And his scores did end up influencing certain composers. And he's executive producing, so the new Halloween movie that came out with Jamie Lee Curtis, which I think is great, he executive produced. He doesn't have the same emotional attachment to that that he does some of his other films, but he's still out there. He's still giving interviews. He's still talking about horror in action film, even though he kind of prefers to not be considered a horror director. I think he's probably said some of the best stuff on the subject. So why is he important? Well, he helped bring mainstream attention and legitimacy to genre features. Again, horror has always had kind of a weird relationship with the audience. Every, for every prestige picture like Rosemary's Baby, we have a whole lot of, uh, you know, low-budget exploitative garbage, which I love and there's a place for. But, you know, in the eyes of the mainstream culture, it's seen as kind of beneath it. But something like Halloween was so big and also so simple and non-exploitative, a lot of people took notice of it. 
Um, he also influenced a lot of filmmakers. You talk to horror filmmakers today and action filmmakers, they'll all say John Carpenter influenced me. And also Hans Zimmer said John Carpenter's scores influenced him. And I mean, what can I say? The guy marches to the beat of his own drum, kind of like John Waters. And, you know, unfortunately, John Waters kind of got Hollywood just, you know, he didn't like it anymore. Um, he kind of, he's done. I would say John is a bit more eager to, John Waters is a bit more eager to make films than Carpenter, but, you know, he's still kind of not there for it. But I think the best thing we can learn from John Carpenter is a lesson of film and a lesson of culture in general. Just because something that you make doesn't hit initially doesn't mean that it won't have a life and that it won't be successful later on. The thing is now cons now considered one of the greatest horror films ever made. The Fog is considered to be a great horror film and again a commentary on what happens when you kind of whitewash and hide your history. Um, even something like They Live has just continuously been memed almost to death but also serves as good commentary even big trouble in little china got a reevaluation and people going you know we didn't appreciate what this movie was doing back then so if you're a creative and you're concerned that what you make might not initially hit don't worry because john carpenter himself will tell you you know eventually people will come around to it and um you know, just hopefully you won't have the bad Hollywood experience that he did. But um, I would say, if you've not talked out any John Carpenter movies, um, I would say anything he made from the 70s to 1988, I would say check out In the Mouth of Madness. But if I had to recommend three starter films, I would recommend The Thing. I would recommend Big Trouble in Little China. And I would recommend Halloween. Oof, maybe just to throw in one for more action-oriented that's more serious and not funny, I'm going to say recommend for an Escape from New York. Pretty much any time he teams up with Kurt Russell, it's fantastic. Or Jamie Lee Curtis. But um, I've blathered on enough about John Carpenter. I love him. Again, 2020, please don't take him. Although he's doing fine. And uh, hopefully you'll check out one of his movies. And I'll see you tomorrow with What's on Netflix.